for your Bibles with you today, turn with me to the book of Luke. Twenty-four, Luke chapter twenty-four. And as you turn there, I'm ready for the kids. I have a question for our kids this morning. I'm going to name four characters from the same TV show. And after I name those four characters, I want to know if you know who they are. Okay, you ready? Here it is. Here's your four characters. Ernie, Cookie Monster, Oscar the Grouch. How many of you know what, what show is All right, I, I see two hands, but that's all I see. So, so we know who that's from. And uh, we know who that, that that's, that's from Sesame Street. Okay, not as many as did do who Bert and Ernie was and, and Monster. But uh, Mr. Hooper was on Sesame Street for 13 years. But in 1982, he died of a heart attack. This left the producers of Sesame Street with quite a dilemma. They had a huge problem. How are they going to explain death to 10 million children who watch the show every day? Now, they could lie about it. And they could say, oh, he retired and moved to Florida. But, but they decided to, to be honest. They decided to let the children know Mr. Hooper had died. Uh, so in, in telling them the truth, you know, being public broadcasting, they, they couldn't tell anything religious. It couldn't mean anything spiritual. So they couldn't say anything about Jesus. They, they, they definitely didn't want to say anything about heaven. So the, what they decided to do was on the day of the show, Big Bird walks out, and Big Bird has a drawing. And he says, he wants to give it to Mr. Hooper. And he says, I can't wait to see Mr. Hooper again. Then they said, remember, Big Bird, we told you Mr. Hooper died. Big Bird goes, oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, I'll give it to him when he comes back. And one of the staff members puts her arms around Big Bird. Said, Big Bird, Mr. Hooper is not coming back. Why not, Big Bird asked. The final line was this. Big Bird, when people died, they don't come back. The message of Sesame Street that day was when people die, they don't come back. Well, this morning I want to tell you, there's at least one time the producers of Sesame Street got it all wrong. Because if when they die, they don't come back, we don't have a reason to be here this morning. We don't have a reason to celebrate Easter. But we know that today is the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let, let's read this story. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start with verse number 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher bringing spices and prayer, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. It came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna. Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the
Money can buy you acquaintances, but it can't buy you friends. Money can buy you medicine, but it can't buy you health. Money can buy you a house, but it can't buy you a home. Money can buy you insurance, but it can't buy you peace of mind. Money can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you sleep. Money can buy you fun, but it sure can't buy you happiness. We cannot find life in our possessions. The second place I find that folks try to find life in a dead situation is some look for life in their activities. They try to find life in the things that they do. Because society has taught us, not, it's not just about what we have, but society teaches us that we also must do more as well. And it's in what we do. We've somehow developed this idea, we've developed this mindset that if we're not going in ten different directions at once, then we're not living. We, we've developed this mindset that if we're not running around like crazy, then we must not be doing anything. So what do we do about it? We put ourselves into more things. We involve our kids into more activities. I know family that I, I lost count, but this is a pretty close number. Last year, this family took at least 27 types of vacation trips. They took 27 different... Now, some of them may have been one-day trips. Some of them may have been uh, overnight trips. Some of them may have been... One of them was a 12-day trip. So, so they were taking different types of trips at least 27 different times. And you know what? They were still not happy. They're still not happy because you cannot find life in dead activities. You cannot find life in your possessions. You cannot find life in your activities. And you cannot find life in your image. And I think the third thing is there are some who they look for life in their image. Think about it. What has society taught us? Society has taught us it's not just about what you have. It's not just about what you do. But it's important to see that for others to see that you have it. And it's important for others to see that you do it. I mean, let's face it. That's why social media has been such a hit. Because social media allows us an outlet to promote what we have. It allows us an outlet to promote what we do. It allows us an outlet to promote who we're with. Uh, on social media, people can see how great of parents we are and what we do for our children. People can see how wonderful our marriages are by the pictures that we post. People can see who our friends are. And we like that because we've tried to make life out of our images. But you know, we can't find life in a dead image. We can't find life in possessions. We can't find life in the things we do. And the fourth area is some people look for life in man-made religion. Now, we know you can't find life in some of the religions around the world. You're not going to find life in Buddhism. You're not going to find life in Mormonism. You're not going to find life in Hinduism. You, you can't find life in Islam. None of those have life. All, all their leaders are dead and will not rise again. But I'm talking about more than that. Some look for life in man-made religion in their church. Because you see, I think here's what we've done often. We've taken the simple good news of Jesus Christ. And we've added so many rules and so many rituals and so many regulations to church that we're trying to find life in a man-made religion. I guarantee you, I will guarantee you that there are folks today who are having a fit because here we are trying to have church in a parking lot. We've never done it like that before. Jesus can't find us if we're still in our cars. I can almost hear it. Why? Because we've made it so much about a man-made religion. We cannot find life in dead religion. But that takes us to our important part.
The, the second thing, that we, the, the most important for us to know, and that is real life is found in Jesus Christ. And, and here's what I want to do. I want to give you three promises that we find in Easter. Three promises of Jesus that give us life. Now, promise number one. Promise number one is the cross is empty. We know today we celebrate that empty tomb. But you know, if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus died on the cross, we'd have no reason to celebrate the tomb. But the cross is empty. Jesus died. And that empty cross shows us a few things. Number one, the empty cross shows us the love of God. God's love, and we have to look at it this way, God's love for us, sinful man. The fact that Jesus died on the cross shows the fact that he loves us even though we were sinners. Now, I realize there's probably some folks right here that they don't think they're a sinner. But the Bible tells us we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the God's glory. We are all sinners. And the Bible also tells us there's a price for that sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages, the price for sin is death. We all, because of sin, we must die. There's a price. But we ask ourselves, why did Christ go to the cross? Why did Christ die? Because he never sinned. Throughout scripture we find Christ never sinned. So we ask, why did he go to the cross? He didn't go for himself. He went for us. He went to the cross not to pay the price for his sin debt. He didn't have any. He went to the cross to pay the price for your sin debt. For my sin debt. For the sin debt of, of all the world. Because God wanted to have eternal fellowship with us. He sent his one and only son to die for the sins of man. The empty cross shows that. The second thing the empty cross shows is the empty cross shows the sacrifice for sin. I want to take you for a brief journey back about 12, 12 hours into the life of Jesus before he died on the cross. He was arrested. We know how he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and they came there and arrested him. They, they took him back. Jesus had to endure four different trials as we look through Scripture. We know that he was beaten with rods. Christ was mocked. Well, we know that, that he was taken to the cross. We know that before that he was beaten to the point where he died from the scourgings. When he was taken to the cross, he was to the beams of that cross. You imagine five inch, five and a half inch spikes going through his wrist, through his hand. To nail him there. But, and we know from that, when that happens, that suffocation, the fluids build up and then it suffocates the body, and, and, and actually, very quickly, they'll die. But the Romans were very cruel in their death. They not only nailed the hands to the cross, which would be a fairly quick death, they would nail the feet as well. You ever wonder why they nailed his feet? He wasn't going anywhere. They did it to make him suffer longer. It's believed that, as they did, they would actually bend the legs a little bit. So that in that will to live that we all have, that will for life, just to push up, just to try to get another breath. Sometimes they say a body can hang on that cross for up to three days, suffering in pain and agony before they actually died. Jesus willingly took the cross. Our Bible says at any moment, he could have called legions of angels to take him down. But he died there. The Romans didn't take his life. He willingly gave his life. Why did Jesus die? He died for sin. And that's the third thing we see from the empty cross. The empty cross is for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus died for our sin. Remember, not his. God wanted to have fellowship with us. But that couldn't happen because our sin separated us from God. Because of our sin, God couldn't have us as, as sinful men into his perfect heaven. He couldn't have that relationship that he wanted. So the price had to be paid. We've already looked at what's the price. It's death. Someone had to die for our sin. Now, folks, we can choose to die for our own sin. 
We can choose to pay our price. But because we're sinners, when we pay that price, that is the end. That is the second death. There will be no more. But God sent his son to pay that price. And the empty cross shows the forgiveness of our sins. The first promise of Easter is the empty cross. The second promise of Easter is the empty tomb. And I want us to look real quick at the empty tomb because this morning we celebrate that empty tomb. Early in the morning it says the women went and they found the tomb empty. Now did they expect the tomb to be empty? No. We know that because they took spices for the body. If they expected an empty tomb, they wasn't going to go spend their money on those spices. They were just going to go see the empty tomb. They expected to find a body in that tomb. Remember their conversation? How are we going to get the stone out of the way? This was a huge stone, kind of like what we would think of a millstone, put in a groove so that it couldn't be moved. We know even better that they were sealed and guarded. They wanted to get that thing out of the way. They didn't know how. But when they got there, the stone was removed. And they found the tomb empty. And that shows us something else the empty tomb represents. The empty tomb represents payment in full. Christ paid the price for our sins when he died for them. When when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins. One of the last phrases that Jesus uttered from the cross was the term tetelestai. Now we know that's not a term that we use often, but we use what it means. The price means paid in full. It would be a banker's term. It would be one that if you owed money, when you made that last payment and you owed nothing else, they would stamp your note to tell us die. Paid in full. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid our price in full. No one would ever have to die again for our sin. No one would ever have to pay that price again. How do we know that God accepted the payment? Because the tomb was empty. Christ had defeated death. Christ had defeated all the powers of Satan. Christ had overcome death, hell, and the grave. And the empty tomb shows us the payment was not only enough, it was accepted by God. And that takes us to the third thing the empty tomb represents. The empty tomb represents eternal life. Many times on what we might call a normal Easter Sunday, either Pastor Nathan or myself with the kids using what we call the resurrection eggs. And it's a dozen little plastic eggs and and in each side of each egg that there's something that tells the story of Jesus. Maybe it's a little crown of thorns. Maybe it's a nail. Maybe it's a beam for a cross. Maybe it's a cloth like the grave clothes they laid him in. It's a little stone to represent the stone in front of, of the tomb. But the last egg, that's the one I, I, can, I can never wait to get to. Because the last egg tells the whole story. In that twelfth egg, there's nothing. It's empty. Because this morning, we know there was an empty tomb. The second promise of Easter is an empty tomb. But I want to give you the third promise that Christ gives us of Easter. The the third promise that that we can know that that, that Jesus is alive. And that's the promise of the empty grave clothes. The, The promise of the fact that the grave clothes was still there. When they entered the tomb, they they saw the the clothes, the, the cloth that Jesus had been wrapped in was laying there. Now, that's important. The body was gone, but the clothes were still there. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, the empty grave clothes shows us, number one, a positive proof. You know, there are folks in that day, and there are folks even today, who will claim that the disciples of Jesus somehow snuck in and took the body of Jesus. That way they can say he lived again. There are still people today that make that claim. But I think the grave clothes prove them different. Because if you stop and think about it. For the disciples to come, that means 11 fishermen. Or or tax collectors. Or uh, zealots. Would have to come. 
overpower Roman guards, move a 2,000 plus pound stone, unwrap a dead body, move it, and put the clothes back just like it had been there. Kind of a far-fetched story if you ask me. I think the grave clothes, the empty grave clothes, show that the resurrection of Jesus took place. Why? Because Jesus didn't need those grave clothes anymore. He was never going to die again. He was going to live forever. The empty grave clothes shows us a positive proof of the resurrection. The other thing the empty grave clothes represent is a personal relationship with Jesus. In the days before Jesus would ascend, because after Jesus rose from the dead, he's actually going to spend a few days with his disciples. And during that time, he's going to walk with them. He's going to talk with them. (coughs) He's going to teach them. He's going to eat with them. He's going to, one more time, he's going to have fellowship with his disciples. You know what the grave clothes mean? The empty grave clothes tells us that today we can also have a personal relationship with Jesus as well. Because Jesus did defeat death. He paid the price, not just for the sin of those 12 to 11 disciples. He paid the price for your sin. He paid the price for my sin. And you know, the Bible tells us if we will just believe, confess our sin with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God who died on a cross, who paid the price, and it was enough, And that he defeated death by rising the third day. If we will but believe that, Scripture tells us we have eternal life. You know, folks, one day, one day if Jesus tarries his coming, they're going to place each of our bodies in some type of tomb. One day. But because we know Jesus... Because we've believed in the Son of God. We can know that that is not the end. That we will live for eternity with Jesus Christ. Folks, we have a decision to make. What are the proofs for us that we have believed in Jesus? I tell you, folks, I meet a lot of folks that if I'll ask them, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? They'll say yes. Do you believe he died on the cross? Yes. Do you believe he rode us the third day? Yes. But we lack one thing. Because see, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And just like any gift, we can pay the price for it. We can wrap it up in ribbon and bows. We can take it and hand it out to someone. But until they receive it to themselves, it never becomes theirs. Just the fact that Jesus died for your sins doesn't make it automatic. The fact that he rose from the dead doesn't mean that without believing you have it at home in eternity. You, each and every person, needs to accept that gift. That gift of eternal life that he gives for yourself. How do you do that? You do it simply by praying. Maybe pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I know I can't save myself. I can't be good enough. I can't go to church enough times. I can't do enough good deeds. I cannot save myself. I'm still a sinner. But I believe Jesus died for my sin. So right now, I want to transfer my trust from myself to Jesus and accept his gift of eternal life. Folks, maybe this morning as I prayed, you prayed that prayer with me. I want to know about it. So send me a message. Send me a text. Give me a call. Let me know that today you, you, you've prayed to ask Jesus in your life. Because day, today we can know we serve a risen Savior. And that Savior can live inside of us. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for our time together. Thank you, Lord, that that we could be together in this place. But we thank you more than that for Jesus. And Lord, right now, I want to pray for each person that, that you have spoken to. Each person that today you have 
said something to their life. I pray, Lord, they'll respond to you. They will say yes to the conviction of your Holy Spirit. They will choose to quit following themselves and following those things that lead to death and follow you. Lord, be with us the rest of this day. And all the days to come, the Lord, everything we say, everything we do, will be glorifying and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.